Okay. All right. All right, so let's get started then. Sorry for a small delay. Um, thank you for hosting me. Uh, this is definitely a pleasure for me to be part of uh, this amazing event. Uh, so today, like uh, Ready Robin said, I'm going to talk about building the HD maps. And particularly, I want to focus on what's the difference uh, of building the maps for autonomous vehicles and for humans. Um, so and I also want to just uh, highlight that uh, uh, pre-compiled maps are very important and can play a key role in uh, further decision making for autonomous vehicles. Um, so the agenda is, is the next one. I'm going to do a bit of intro, then just talk a bit about the data uh, collection and use cases. And then we're going to look through uh, some feature examples and what are the challenges that we got and just some takeaways and obviously Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, just a few words about myself. Uh, I'm an engineering lead at Intelias. For the past one year and a half, I've been leading two teams working in high autonomous driving space and full autonomous driving. And we're building pre-computed maps. And um, well, yeah, prior to that, I, uh, I worked a lot in, on big data and also doing some machine learning uh, for e-commerce uh, company. And um, overall, like I have uh, more than 10 years of software engineering practices. And uh, yeah, so that's like very briefly about myself. And like I said, I'm currently working at Intelias. So just a few interesting things about Intelias. So Intelias is a Ukrainian company. We're providing services in software engineering for, for different vendors. Uh, we have a very broad experience working with uh, in automotive industry and worked a lot with uh, uh, with the different vendors like Audi, Daimler, here technology and many others. Um, and yeah, so primarily uh, we have like 16 hundreds of uh, engineers in house. Most of the people are located in Ukraine. We have uh, different locations. There are also a few offices that we have uh, around the globe. And yeah, the company is quite specialized on some, some of these services. Now I think we can uh, perhaps uh, uh, move on and just talk a bit about the, uh, the, the how we compile the maps and how uh, the teams that I'm working with, how well, what are the different differences that we've seen, how the data is collected. So if we talk about uh, collecting the data in terms of high autonomous driving or full autonomous driving, the process is pretty much the same. So we have the cars that are driving around the world and collecting all the data. Uh, obviously, these cars are equipped with uh, many different sensors. And there are already a couple of presentations about um, uh, sensor systems that are used on vehicles. So obviously, uh, we're getting information from LIDAR. We're getting data, uh, some perception uh, data from different uh, sensors. We're also getting some imaginary data, like a 360 uh, view of everything that is going around. Uh, and also there's some offline data that is collected, like you know, some GIC data and some government data. Um, so this is all these different sources are all combined in order to build the, uh, the uh, high definition map for high autonomous driving or, and full autonomous driving. For humans, uh, usually all this perception step is less necessary since humans have slightly different use case and the maps that are used by humans, they, they have slightly easier use case and and all these additional sensors, they, they serve uh, uh, less uh, you know, important need than for uh, high autonomous driving and full autonomous driving. And um, I like I already mentioned, the use cases are slightly different. So uh, humans, they usually have a simple use case you want to get from point A to point B. And the way you use the map, you just, you know, uh, it's sort of a navigation for you, right? So you have an assistant that tells you what you have to do and how you have to uh, you know, navigate on the road. And a um, human is the one that is responsible for taking a decision, right? So the, the map in this case is primarily used as, as a guidance and there is, an, a, there is a room for error. So if the map doesn't, you know, uh, missing some, some of the uh, information, that is still acceptable since the human can make a decision and still can get from point A to point B. Obviously, uh, you still try to make your map as precise and as accurate as possible, but there is some room for, for error. 
Um, if we talk about the high autonomous driving, uh, primarily the map is used for a certain system within the vehicle. And most of us are very familiar with some of them, like advanced driver assistance, or like uh, keeping your uh, vehicle in the lane, or you know, trying to steer your wheel just to get you uh, uh, from you know, one lane to another, or doing the maneuver. So these are primarily the systems uh, like uh, where uh, our pre-computed maps are used, obviously, in navigation as well. So trying to uh, make a better experience for, um, for humans who are driving these high autonomous vehicles uh, to get from point A to point B. Um, for full autonomous driving, uh, our maps, the, the one that we were working on, they, they primarily used in two subsystems, uh, very important ones. So one is uh, localization, so it tries to help you or try to help you localize your vehicle in the environment. So it tries to build the visual map of what is surrounding this vehicle. What are the different objects there? Is there a tree? Is there, like primarily these are uh, static objects, right? So for uh, dynamic objects, you have to use a slightly different stack and usually that's where the uh, sensors are, are used. But for static objects, our maps can is a perfect match there because uh, we can completely describe everything surrounding you. And usually these things they don't change very often, right? So uh, if there was a sidewalk next to next to the road, that thing doesn't change that often, you know. Like um, for majority of urban uh, urban roads, the other system where the uh, pre-computed maps are are used, uh, and this is really based on how the current architecture uh, of the autonomous driving vehicles is, is done. So for obstacle, uh, we, we, the maps are also used in obstacle avoidance system. And the obstacle avoidance system is a system that helps uh, a vehicle uh, to make the, the right decisions, you know, so uh, making sure that a vehicle is not going to run over uh, a pedestrian or is not going to crash into uh, into a divider or is not going to go over a median or some gore areas because there are so many different things that are uh, on the road. So uh, the map is playing a very key role there because these things are already pre-computed and the vehicle can already know that there is no uh, need actually like uh, you know, to go to that direction, there might be some obstacle there. Um, since whatever you uh, try to compute that in real time, there, but th there, is, there is a chance that there will be some, some errors. Um, so yeah, uh, and this is leading to, to another um, you know, common, this, like there, there primarily there are existing two ways of building your autonomous vehicle. So they either can be uh, focused on and you know, using vision sensors as a main input. So in that case, uh, you rely a lot on deep learning and uh, convolutional neural networks. So you try to assess what surrounds the vehicle in real time. And there's another way or another architecture of how you can build your autonomous vehicles. And those are primarily um, focused on using existing sensor system like LIDAR and also pre-computed maps. So there are advantages and disadvantages of each of them. Uh, this vision, obviously, like I already said, uh, you, you may lack some accuracy there, whereas with LIDAR and pre-computed maps, some of these things, they're already going to be uh, pre-computed and they will be already in your vehicle. And this is actually a lot of information. So getting like processing this information in real time requires uh, for vehicle to have a very good and very um, you know um, streamlined uh, hardware as well as, as, as software and like my previous presenters were already saying you know like there is quite a lot of advancement and things going on uh, with with hardware and investments in, 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 in into that space so definitely that's one of the things that is gonna keep growing uh, but um, also using pre-computed maps is helps you a lot since some of these uh, hardware and software can be used for some other systems and trying to you know uh, make a, a more uh, you know safer environment and a safer experience for the for the drivers uh, since for full autonomous driving for instance um, there is no uh, a requirement there is, like it's not guaranteed that uh, a human can take over control with high autonomous driving, obviously, it's still a requirement. They usually, this is like L, L2, L3, 
and this is still a requirement for a human to be next to the to a steering wheel and at any point of given time if the vehicle says you know the data is not accurate then you should take over control um, so uh, because of all this information also like the, our per computed maps they they need to know uh everything that surrounds you and this requires uh you know uh some very high accuracy so the data has to be precise up to one millimeter so we cannot miss like one centimeter or one meter you know, because that's very crucial for autonomous vehicles uh, but getting that requirements from our experience you know we need to be very precise with the geometry of all these objects like a crosswalk or a sidewalk or a lane you know all these different objects and even like where the stop lane is located or how can you uh, you know do a maneuver from one side to another so from our experience getting that geometry accuracy it requires like it significantly increases the size of your data that you have so you it also increases the um, the amount of data that you have to place on the vehicle. So we have to think about uh, how can we optimize that. For humans, usually these things are not um, a big requirement because like, you don't really use a, a geometry of different objects that surrounds you. And uh, the maps that, uh, that are built for humans, they, they primarily just uh, very much like a graph, you know, and, and you cannot like, just the main idea is to get you from point A to point B. But it's less interesting what is what are the different objects around you. For high autonomous driving, uh, we also have a very high accuracy requirements, uh, but the geometry um, there might be some inaccuracies, but very little. Obviously, there's some room for uh, for error, and um, if there's some data is not available, it's it's not end of the world, you know. So high, the autonomous vehicle uh, can still um, you know uh, give back control to a human, and a human can take over control and just drive uh, through that area if the data is partially available. Um, the next thing that I also want to talk about is the the, the data format, since um, we spend a lot of time in uh, pre-computing the maps. And from our experience, uh, it's quite a significant amount of data. And usually we are talking about the gigabytes of data. And, and the, the more accurate the data you want to be, the, 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 the bigger the data uh, size, uh, the size of the data is going to be. So from our experience, uh, working with the, these two uh, data formats, they provide you an ability to achieve uh, you know, uh, high compression and uh, you know save some some space and especially given that uh, we have a very limited uh, hardware requirements on, on vehicles uh, this also speeds up the processing and also getting uh, like retrieving the data uh, whatever you need that and keeping that in memory so uh, protobuf is definitely the uh, one of the formats that we use uh, very often and it's been proven that uh, you can you, you can have exactly the same map in Crotobuf and it's going to take up to uh, 100, between like 10 and 100 times less than if you would uh, keep the same uh, pre-computed map, but in JSON or XML or many or any other formats. And NDS, I think everyone is uh, most likely is familiar, but it's a navigation data standard. Um, this is also a very good format. Uh, it also allows you to not be really a vendor lock and you can combine and you know, slice and dice different maps from different vendors. Uh, though there are obviously also some challenges or how can you incorporate certain new features into that format. With ProtoBuff, obviously you have a bit of less of these challenges and you have a lot of uh, flexibility there. Um, so, now let's also look a bit about the features from um, from our experience. What are the differences between the maps uh, for, um, excuse me, for humans? Um, usually, the map for humans it consists of the road model and uh, a, let's say a road network and all attributes that surround that road network. Uh, for high autonomous driving, there's some additional features that are appearing there. On top of road model, you also have a uh, lane model and also some uh, relationship between these lanes and the roads. Uh, there's also some additional uh, attributes that are lane specific since for high autonomous driving, 
your um, vehicle is going to drive in a specific lane, but the attributes or or the requirements at that lane are slightly different. So if you are driving, if the road consists of three lanes and you're driving on the far left lane, then it's not exactly the same if you were driving, for instance, on the right, on the far uh, right lane. And all these things are very important there. And it's very crucial to, uh, you know, start recognizing that the main, uh, you know, the, the key uh, attribute here is the lane and the relationship between the lane and the roads and how the lane relate to each other. There's some also relationship to some surrounding objects uh, for high autonomous driving. You still want to know the signs, you still want to know the traffic uh, lights. Mm -hmm. So there's still some initial information about the different objects that are on the road itself. For uh, full autonomous driving, from our experience, uh, what we already have for autonomous driving, for high autonomous driving, is not enough. There are some additional features that need to be added. And primarily, these are the objects that are surrounding the road um, and not limited to that. So these are the different sidewalks. Uh, different, like, you also need to know precise geometry of the, of the crosswalk or stop lane, or would it be a yield lane, depending on which region you are. Um, you also want to know where uh, the different vertical objects are located. If this is a tree that is somehow connected to the road or is pretty close to the road, do you really want to know that? And usually, like these objects, they they're very static and they don't change very often. So once you uh, you add them uh, and pre-compute it, they they stay there. Um, and I I mentioned some of these features, but there are obviously more of them. And um, so this is the different features that our team had experience working with, and some really different lessons learned uh, that we got while working on on, on these features. So. Um, the next few slides, what I want to spend time uh, for is actually, uh, you know, going through some of this, some of this feature and uh, look through the lenses of how these features are perceived by humans and how these features are perceived by autonomous vehicles and how we were solving some, some of the challenges with this, with, with this feature. So um, let's look at the first example. Uh, let's look at this intersection and the screenshot that I have here is a uh, is a view from the top of a very dense intersection. Uh, this is some of the internal tools that we have just to do a, a 2D view. We can also have a 3D view just to see how all these objects are related to each other. What's their elevation? Uh, uh, you know, what's their relationship? Uh, but the idea of this of, of this slide is actually to highlight how many different objects can be located in, the, in a single intersection. And it's just a few of them, so it's not actually all of them. Um, but as you could see, like there are two roads uh, that are crossing each other, and then you have, uh, a, you have a crosswalk uh, that uh, pedestrians are using to cross the road. And there's some uh, right dot, like red dots and blue dots. So these are different signs that are located along the, the road and also the, the traffic signals. Uh, what I also try to highlight here is how, with the blue lines, is how the vehicle can navigate from a certain lane and where uh, the vehicle can take a maneuver. So all these things are, are very important, and we build a, uh, you know, a very sophisticated network between different lanes and the objects. So uh, the vehicle can understand that these are uh, the lanes that I can, uh, you know, uh, turn, or I can go straight, or I can do a U-turn. Or perhaps there's also another lane that someone can do the same, uh, and we're gonna end up in the same lane. So there's a lot of these, lot, lots of these things, uh, and lots of many requirements that that, that you need to understand. Uh, there are also sidewalks that we try to uh, you know, to render since uh, it's it's a it's a it's an important metadata information that can be later used in the vehicle uh, from our experience that you can anticipate that there are some uh, dynamic obstacles that can appear. So it might be humans, it might be some animals that all, all of a sudden can try to, to cross, or there might be humans with animals. So there are many different uh, things that, that, that can happen, and you need to, uh, to be able to assess whether there is a, a potential uh, hazard or you know, there's an obstacle that, that can appear. So, the next example that I, that I want to show is an example of uh, um, of the road. Uh, so uh, 
for full autonomous driving, uh, our team has been um, primarily building the maps for uh, for some limited draws since this is uh, very challenging and there's a lot of, uh, like I said, high accuracy requirements and there's a lot of very sophisticated uh, computations. Um, this is an example of uh, one, one of the places on the roads that we were building a map and there are two signs there and uh, it's pretty clear for human that for humans that the sign on uh, on the on the left uh, that is located on on another uh, road that is uh, going on top of this one uh, it is for humans and it's pretty clear that the driver uh, that is going through this road uh, can comprehend this sign and can make a decision based on that um, and the sign on the right is pretty clear that is also for this road. Uh, when are we building a compiler in a map, that might be a bit more challenging since that sign is sort of, uh, it, it is kind of, uh, you know, linked to this road, but it also can be perceived that it's linked to another road. So for, uh, for autonomous vehicle, and this is just one of the examples, there are more sophisticated examples that, that, than this on, on the roads. and. Uh, it's sometimes it's not that easy to, to solve and you need to uh, come up with a different algorithms or how to solve this. But what I'm trying to say that all these simple things is um, they make your uh, pre-computed maps quite challenging and also like trying to uh, get some of these things in real time is also might be challenging because uh, what we've seen also some of these signs might be a bit uh, uh, like located a bit higher and they can be on with the angle. So it's not really clear is this really uh, relates to this road or to another road, uh, but the human can really comprehend that information. But uh, so obviously we saw some of some of these chances. We tried to understand at which uh, level the sign is located. What's the angle? Is it looking our side or, or towards us or against us? Um, so all these things are solvable, but uh, what I'm just trying to say also is that uh, the roads are uh, very much designed for humans and less designed for autonomous vehicles to drive. So let's look at uh, another example and some like a challenge that uh, our team also had and solved. Um, you can see on the right there's a, uh, there's a photo of a, of a human or, or a driver who actually crossed the stop line. Um, I guess you all guys are familiar with what the stop line is. Uh, in, so in some countries, this is a stop line. There's in, in Europe, there's very often they're used also yield lines or yield triangles. And um, as we can see on the uh, right screenshot, uh, human crossed that, that, that lane. And um, it's not a big deal, right? So it, you know, once, once the traffic light turns green, then you can proceed and you know, take whatever manure you need, or if you suddenly see that, um, you know, another vehicle cannot uh, make, a, uh, you know, do a manure, then the, the driver can actually go back a bit and, uh, and let the other driver drive. But in case of autonomous vehicle, these are not the cases that you want to have. So um, your vehicle has to stop exactly before that stop line. And there's no way that you, you can cross that. But um, if there is a stop line, that's a that's an easy problem to solve. So like you just really know that there's a stop line, and if you use some of the perception stack or computer vision, that's pretty clear. You see the line, you stop. Um, once it's safe, you go you go next. But what if there is no such a line? Uh, what if the pain is is not there? And we could definitely see that that sometimes the pain is just it's gone or it's not clear or it's not really clear. If this is even a line, you know and there are many of cases like this. So how are you going to solve these cases? Um, and for that, what our team has done uh, in the maps that, that, that we pre-computed is that we created a virtual stop line. Because we know that the, at this place, the vehicle has to stop. And no matter if the, uh, you know, if the pain is, gonna, is not going to be there or uh, after a certain period of time, uh, it's just uh, not going to be visible. Uh, the vehicle is still going to know that it can stop there. So those are very crucial uh, details that our pre-computed map can solve. And there are many examples like this. Uh, and uh, like just in the interest of time, I, I focus just on, on a few of them. Uh, and this virtual stop line is, is important and it 
like I already mentioned previously, it, it plays a key role also in some uh, obstacle avoidance system or, or localization systems. Um, just in the interest of time, I think I will go to the, um, to the uh, key takeaways from, uh, from my presentation. Um, so first of all, uh, these high accuracy requirements, they require um, a lot of uh, like a bigger computation, uh, you know, a more sophisticated hardware on, on your vehicle. But uh, also be in the pre-computed maps, uh, this is a challenge obviously to make uh, this data extremely accurate. So the scale for uh, fully autonomous driving is something that um, that has to be addressed, and uh, well, we've we've been working with that. Um, I said, like I already said, the geometry precision is is very important, and for high autonomous driving and full autonomous driving, these are uh, key points. For humans, this is less less important, and you can live without that. Um, there is a very sophisticated uh, dependency between the, the objects that are on the road, but also that are surrounding the roads. I spoke a bit about the volume of the data and how using some of the optimized data formats can help you, uh, you know, save some time and also speed up some of your uh, computing and usage of our pre-computed maps in the vehicle. Uh, and um, yeah, so just the uh, very last uh, thing that I want to talk about. Um, since we've been working on, on these things for, uh, for already for some time, here are a few things that I think is going to change uh, in the future. So what I think is that uh, some of the, um, I expect some changes in, in the road and uh, city infrastructure development. Since, like I said, primarily the roads are designed for humans. They're not designed for autonomous vehicles. And I expect that some of these things are gonna change. It's not gonna be a widespread thing, but I also expect that uh, there will be some, uh, you know, uh, some collaboration between uh, um, automakers and, and vendors uh, and government just to address some of these issues and also create some specific places where the autonomous driving is gonna be permitted. So I expect that over the next couple of years, it's gonna be uh, fine to have certain areas where uh, you can actually enable some autonomous driving mode, and it's it's, it's going to be it's going to be controlled by uh, by certain rules, and the road is going to be adapted for that. What I also expect that uh, there will be more investment in over-the-air communication, since the maps that we are also uh, developing they they change, uh, so things are changing not very often, but in some places that we the map is changing and we want to make sure that the autonomous vehicle has the, the up-to-date map in real time or near real time. So I expect that a lot of these things are going to happen on, in, in vehicle and there will be more advances in, in some of this technology. And it's going to be uh, a normality to have a car that updates over the air, uh, you know, any, any, any time and you don't really have to connect this or go to, um, you know, to a service and, and get things updated. Um, so I think that's pretty much it from my side, and I think in terms of time, um, we can move on to the Q&A session. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much um, for, for the presentation. Um, I, of course, will um, now uh, ask you the questions that we received. So sure. um, the, the first question that we got, let, let me... Make this one. So, yeah, the, the first question that we got um, was what is most essential for building high accuracy maps for autonomous vehicles again? So, I mean, very broadly again, but uh, just if you, you could break it down to maybe like the two or three most essential parts of it. I think the, the most essential part is obviously um, getting the, the like collecting the, the accurate data. So very important to, to receive uh, this data. And very often you have to, like, you know, the, the vehicles that we use to collect the data around, uh, around the world, uh, they have to drive at least multiple, sometimes multiple times through the same road. So the accuracy of the data that we're gonna collect is gonna help us. Uh, so, it, it, I mean, it's a key uh, thing to build the most accurate uh, HD maps. And, the, the second thing is obviously understanding very much the domain of how your map is going to be used and what is important for uh, for for the for you know uh, 
for the vendors what sort of uh, features because there's so many different things that that you can build in but um, obviously we need to focus on specific use cases or how the map is going to be used by autonomous vehicle um, um, i think that that's a perfect transition to to actually the second question which is um, how can you overcome flaws in perception and still build accurate maps? Uh, could you could you please mis, uh, sure. repeat the question? Uh, uh, how how, how the can you one. sorry? Yeah. How can you overcome flaws in perception and still build accurate maps? So you, for example, already tackled that sometimes you need to to drive one road uh, several times in order to collect all the the right. data needed. So I think it maybe aims in that direction. Right, so I think it, it's a definitely a good question. So thank you. I think, think thanks everyone for, for good questions. Um, so in this case, obviously doing a completely uh, automated way of building the maps is not always um, uh, achievable. So in certain cases, whatever the data is not accurate enough, uh, there should be some uh, human intervention. And that's what we have. So there, uh, there's also um, a a lot of uh, people who are reviewing some of the very challenging places where we're not really sure uh, if the data is accurate or not. And based on that, the human can make a decision based on the data that's been collected from, uh, from perception. Since these are many different things, right? So, you, um, and it depends obviously on what weather condition that the drive has been done. So in some cases, the drive can go through a very you know, heavy rain and some of the data might be a bit uh, noisy or extremely difficult to understand. So in that case, we either recollect the data again, or they, like I already said, there are also human intervention where we have uh, operators that are trying to view the data and make a decision based on that like trying to fix some of the items on the map uh, and you know and these things can be used then later by uh, by our teams to compile uh, the data and make it more accurate so uh, just also maybe as a, a small follow-up question so that would mean uh, if there is uh, the perfect setting which we we heard earlier about by maybe uh, like in arizona or something where the sun is shining all the time and you have <laughs> perfectly prepared roads so that would mean that usually data collecting is rather easy and therefore the mapping process as well but for for example if you drive around in and uh, really bad weather conditions maybe fog or something um, then you would need to interfere and uh, actually we do the process a couple of times to, to be sure that you collected everything perfectly, right? Exactly, right. So okay. there's obviously a lot of uh, verification that is happening just to make sure is the data is, is good enough to be used. If the data is not good enough to be, to be used for, the, uh, or, you know, for uh, building a map, then it has to be uh, you know, redriven uh, a, a few more times just to make sure we can achieve our high accuracy. Um, and sometimes you, you, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a process where um, you have uh, some road and half of the road has been uh, like it's very well displayed on one drive, but then another half of the road is in another drive. So we try to uh, mix and match some of these data just to make sure we can have a full picture. So in some cases that can be achieved by, by, by doing that. And well, the, the next question also more or less aims in that direction, but uh, it, it's more in the sense of what do you think um, are the, the main challenges in, in that perspective in, in regard to the future? And um, I, th I think I'll, I'll add another one because it aims in the, in the same direction by another of our, of our attendees, which is um, are there small changes in our current, in, in, well, European, in that case, European roads? Because uh, I think that aims at the, the last things you said that would enable autonomous vehicles to drive there already and uh, also to to be able to um, uh, collect all the data already because you think um, I, I would just remember the the stop uh, sign thing um, I think in that respect like if what small changes in current roads and environments could lead to uh, enabling autonomous vehicles to already um, drive out there um, yeah so for, I think I'll start from the from the last sure. one and um, yeah, so I think well, what I was saying that pretty much the roads are designed with signs that are just used by uh, by humans, but there's some enhancement that we can place also, and there are many different interesting ideas. One well, one of the things that I see how to address this, and this is my personal like perspective, is that mm -hmm. some of these things can be also uh, uh, you know 
mounted with with certain uh, sensors so that uh, whatever the the vehicle is going to drive, it, like a perception stack, also can understand that uh, and receive this data from some of these sensors. And some of the some of the cities already trying to adopt some of these concepts. And you know, very often we perhaps uh, hear about this like smart cities where um, you know, there's like some par smart parking lots or smart uh, uh, crosswalks or you know, pedestrian crossing. So some of these things, so I expect these things are gonna change and, uh, and uh, we see more sensors on the roads that are just part of the uh, uh, road roadblocks. And um, yeah, so the, there will be just new rules of how you can build the road. So this is, at least from my perspective, how some of these things can be, can be solved and trying to you know, uh, connect our vehicles to some of these sensors. Uh, so, so we'll, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Sorry. go ahead. I was mm -hmm. just going to ask you to repeat uh, the first question, the first part of the question. Yes, uh, uh, the first part um, was, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. let me look if I get the right one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maya, what, what challenges remain most pressing uh, for the future in regard to level four plus? I think that aims in the, in the same direction though. Right, so I, I think the, the, the biggest challenge also there are how to scale this. Um, so the, the pre-computed maps that we did were on the limited roads and um, you know, in very controlled environments. So we, we had uh, some time and learn about how the roads are structured there. But as we try to scale this and expand this, um, like it's very important to keep this high accuracy. And I think uh, like for all the objects that are surrounding you, uh, and I think that the challenges there is how you're gonna keep scaling some, 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 of, this, some of this data processing and whether you actually need that um, everywhere and maybe just in the certain places. So uh, for, for instance, for HD maps that are used for more like L3, uh, L2, I think in that case, the, the, the challenges there are primarily like uh, trying to understand what the information is needed and what is not, just to also make it ex as precise and as, um, as slim so that it can be used by, by vehicles without any redundant information. What I also um, uh, think the challenge is how uh, obviously make it more uh, real time. And I expect that some of this, uh, like the map is gonna, uh, like the architecture of how the maps are gonna be built is also gonna change slightly. Um, so, so I think some of these things, uh, I, I, I think that uh, there will be, uh, you know, will we try to get a, uh, the best of two worlds where we use like some computer vision and trying to build a map in real time and also having a map that's been pre-computed. So I think some of these two approaches, I, I, I see that, uh, uh, we can solve many challenges if we try to, you know, fuse some of these two technologies at the same time and try to get some of the, like, the best of uh, of the two worlds. That's it. Okay. Um, uh, uh, another quick question was, I think, to to one of your slides earlier. Um, one sure. user asked, uh, could you again quickly describe the main differences between NDS and Protobuf? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I think. Uh, so NDS is really, uh, uh, you know, it's a standard that's used by uh, different uh, vendors. So primarily it's like, it allows you to fuse different data, like maps that are produced by different vendors. And there's a consortium where you have to uh, kind of like they're driving the requirements or how the map is structured. And it's well described, uh, it's very high regulated and it's pretty clear on uh, what are, how can you get a different features from that uh, from that format and um, so, and it, it is very high optimized and if we speak about uh, protobuf uh, protobuf is the, the reason why I mentioned also protobuf because we uh, make our maps uh, in these two formats and one the NDS format uh, allows our customers to um, to use this data uh, in, co in conjunction with some other data or with some other vendors. But with Protobuf, for instance, you might get uh, a slightly different organization of the data and we can make it more uh, customized for specific needs of the vendors. And, and also it's very high optimized in terms of space. So usually like the, the maps that, that we produce, we keep them in two formats, just depending on how the vendors can use them. 
Um, why we also like protobuf is that, uh, like I said, uh, it like it's, it's like the amount of data that you can keep in protobuf compared like keeping the map in protobuf and compiling it uh, in any other formats, uh, like you can you can achieve uh, some significant reduction in the size and keeping it in a vehicle where we already have a limited amount of resources i think is very important and also looking in in the future that these updates of the maps especially given that you only receive the pieces where the map has been updated uh sending this data over the air is going to save a lot of uh, a lot of space and uh the the, the speed of uh, getting updates is just going to be way way faster and um, you know limited bandwidth that sometimes we have on, on, on our phones or in areas where we drive i think this is a huge win um okay um i, th I think the, the the last part the, the last question that i got was on uh, actually the question before that um sure. where you already tackled the a little bit on the on the future of mapping um when you when you said also uh, that uh, if i if i um recollect right um, that you would use what you're using right now, but also um, put in simulation basically as a as a method. Um, how much of that is already the case, and how quickly do you think that will uh, change? Uh, 